Please. Thanks, Mike. No, you're all set. I'm set. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I guess can't get too close to that microphone. Turn this off. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'm Jack Sajovic. I uh, recently returned from Ukraine and Georgia, where I was uh, evacuating my family. Speaking of family, my brother is here, Bob Sajovic. He was a, he's an Air Force Academy graduate. He flew C-5s in the Gulf in 1991, um, and then retired and went to work for Delta. So he, he switched to the dark side. <laughs> and I think he served, what, 15 years with Delta before retiring? 31. Oh, I undershot. Uh, anyway, Bob's a, a great guy. He was the captain of the Air Force Academy hockey team. And I think he's the second all-time leading scorer for Air Force, unless he's been bypassed in the last couple of years. He's still there. So he was quite an athlete. Um, uh, had quite a, it continues to have quite a successful career. Um, but I want to talk about, beside the family, I want to talk about Ukraine, where the rest of my family is, right? Where's that pointer? Must be in my pocket. Is that it? Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'll be talking about a lot of different areas in Ukraine. Um, a little history of Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine was one of 15 republics of the former Soviet Union that was formed in 1917 uh, when Russia, the Russian Tsar died and the Soviet Union was formed under Lenin and Stalin and the, the group of bandits. Um, and that stayed in place through World War II. We were allies of Russia during that time. Um, and we maintained pretty good relationships. In 1991, President Gorbachev was in charge. And you may remember there was a coup in 1991, and he was overthrown while he was in Crimea. He was down here in Yalta, I think, or Sevastopol. So that kind of broke up that aspect of, of the Soviet Union. Um, 20, 2008, Russia invaded Georgia, which is an indication of their aggressive approach to the rest of their former uh, satellites or former countries that were part of the Soviet Union. Um, in 2014, I was in Kiev at that time, there was the Orange Revolution, and Russian sympathizers attacked Ind Independent Square, and there was a lot of deaths. And uh, President Yanukovych at that time, who was closely affiliated with Russia, um, ended up having to bolt the country. And he, let, he went from Kiev uh, over here into this part of, of Russia. And he's still there, I think. I don't think he's returned. But that's when the revolution of dignity started in, in Ukraine. Um, a lot of, a lot of uh, support for the anti-Russian uh, occupation. So, but that's continued. That's 2014 until uh, in March of 2014, Donetsk and Lugansk formed the DNR and the PNR, the Donetsk People's Republic and Lugansk People's Republic. So they kind of became separate from the rest of Ukraine. And they have been recognized by Moscow as a part of, a part of Russia, which is a very controversial thing, needless to say. Um, in January of this year, Russia massed forces along, whoops, Russia massed forces along the Ukrainian border, Belarus and, and this part of, of Russia, and there was something like 100,000 forces at that time. Um, my family was in Kiev. I flew over there because we knew there was an advance warning that it probably would be an attack. It was questionable whether to believe it or not. So So 
so we decided to get out of there. And on, uh, on February 8th, um, if, uh, in February, Russia just massed 100,000 troops along these borders and they decided to advance. The question is where would they come, how would they come? Uh, the intelligence we were seeing was they're probably going to be coming from the north because that's the closest. But the real support in the country is from the east. That, that is Russian speaking. A lot of these people identify with Russia. And so there's a great fear that they would, they would try to make their way to Kiev. And one of Putin's big mistakes, he overestimated the potential of Russian forces to quickly defeat the Ukrainian defenders. The Ukrainians are really tough and they're fighting for their homeland and they continue to fight for their homeland. So when attempts were made to attack coming down past Chernobyl, past the reservoir, they got stopped in this area. They didn't get into Kiev. They fired missiles into Kiev, but they didn't, the ground troops didn't make it in. And that was due to the strong resolve of the Ukrainian people. Uh, they deserve a lot of credit for that. So anyway, they were coming in on three axes of, of advance, from the north, from Belarus, from the west, which was Russian supported, they were going to come in this way. They got stopped before Dnipro, and from the south, coming in from Crimea, which they took over in 2014, and they had built up quite a few forces there, and the thought was they'd come in these three directions. But the Ukrainians basically stopped all the advances. Uh, they're still continuing, to, obviously, continuing to fight today. Um, this is more of a, a current situation. Um, this is the area, as of August 31st, this is Ukrainian counteroffensive has begun. And this is very surprising, I think. We kept hearing there's going to be a counteroffensive. Well, it has begun, and it's ongoing as we speak. I got updates this morning that they're making great progress, pushing back the, the Russians out of a number of these small villages and towns. And that's amazing. And how are they doing it? It's a combination of weapons supplied by the West, in particular the US, and, and just the tenacity and the spirit of the Ukrainian people. Um, one of the, one of the uh, assets they're using is this HIMARS system, which are very powerful artillery pieces that fire 50 miles and within 10 meters of their target, they can they can launch and, and destroy command and control centers, supply depots, or any kind of force buildup. And they've been doing it with great success. And the estimate is maybe perhaps 50,000 Russians have been killed up to this point in the, in the battle. 50,000? Um, 50,000, 50, mm -hmm. which is, we're looking at what, what was the loss in Vietnam? Was 90? 58,000 in Vietnam. And they've lost 50,000 since, since March. The, the Russian forces generally not considered top notch. Um, they're they're going into battle without a great sense of purpose. They're just told where to go. A lot of them are mercenaries coming in from Chechnya and other areas. So there's not like a, a national feeling of this is a, this is what we need to do. There's a feeling from on top. Putin feels that Ukraine should still belong to Russia. And that's a big part of the reason for this whole thing. He wants to recreate the former Soviet Union and perhaps the Russian Empire. Um, he's a little bit of a megalomaniac, narcissist, and, uh, he, <laughs> and he's acting on that. I mean, he already took, he already took Crimea, uh, one long way. He already took Crimea back in 2008, which was uh, pretty controversial. But there was well, no reaction from the West for that, though. No, that was, that was under an administration that didn't want to upset the apple cart. Mm -hmm. So we kind of let him do that. Yes, ma'am? You're talking about Georgia. What yes. Georgia? Georgia is, let's see if we got, probably don't have it on the map that shows it. I thought it showed Georgia. One does show it? Yeah. 
maybe go back to the original one with cities. <coughs> so, uh, <coughs> look down to the right. Georgia is uh, back back over here. Oh, okay. Um, I wasn't familiar. So. Yeah, when, when my family and I left, we went from Kiev into this area near Poltava, drove cross country through Moldova, Romania, down, and then we flew to flew to Georgia. So we we got to see a lot of the back country of Ukraine getting out of there. Now, why, why did you pick Georgia to, for your family? Uh, as opposed to one of the other, Poland or something like that? My wife was smart enough several years ago to buy property in Georgia. So we have three apartments on the Black Sea uh, in Georgia. And that was a, for us, that was a natural place to, to bail to. Uh, otherwise, I don't think we would have gone there. The natural inclination to go to Poland. Um, but anyway, Georgia was, became our exit route. And, uh, and Georgia is beautiful, and the people are friendly, and they love Ukrainians. You see Ukrainian flags everywhere. Weren't they decimated by the Russians 10 years ago? They were, yeah, Russia invaded them in 2008, and uh, yeah, they did a lot of damage. So Georgians have a real feeling against the Russians, so they support Ukrainians. And that was, that was very important to us as well. After uh, Russia, are those the two biggest republics, um, Ukraine and Georgia, I mean, uh, they're very influential. Ukraine is the second behind Russia in terms of the former Soviet Union. Georgia doesn't fit into that category. Georgia's pretty small. Huh? I mean, Belarus is probably the next in size. Um, in terms of wealth and influence, the Baltic countries, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia are very important. Um, so, but Belarus is uh, very close to Russia. They support them. Lukashenko, their president, is almost as megalomaniacal as, uh, as Putin. So they've tried to, they've tried to join forces, and um, very dangerous combination. In the beginning of the war, you heard stories of Belarus maybe joining the invasion from mm -hmm. the north. But I guess now that that front is quiet, you don't hear anything about Belarus. Don't, and it's surprising. Actually, I thought the same thing initially. We heard that there were going to be an invasion from Belarus, which in fact happened. But it was the Russian forces coming in. It wasn't Belarusian forces. Um, I, don't, I don't know why that is, quite honestly. I would have thought that they would have convinced them. Question back here. Sir. Yeah, <clears throat> one of the, uh, at the leading up to the invasion, of course, we knew that the Russians were massing troops on the border. Right. And uh, uh, one of the, the theories is that, that they were uh, so readily repelled, or at least uh, eventually repelled, was that uh, they really thought it was going to be a liberation. They thought that they were going to come in and Ukrainians were going to go, oh, great, the Soviet, or the former Soviets here, the Russians are here, and uh, welcome them with open arms. And that didn't happen. Did not happen. And one of the reasons I've been told or heard about was that uh, the Russian, uh, Putin, had uh, put a lot of money into uh, Ukrainian leadership, political leadership, to try to welcome the Russians as they invaded. Mm -hmm. But that, that money was accepted, but they weren't about to use it uh, to you know, because it was their home. Right. And that Putin was pretty upset about that, and that uh, that's one of the reasons why some of his top security people disappeared. Because There's they were responsible for getting the money to the Ukraine. Have you, have you, well, you know, um, Yanukovych, who was the president during that initial time, was pro-Russian, right. and so they thought that they could convince him to convince his cabinet and other people to, uh, to support Russia. President Zelensky was elected. He was this, right. he was this character who, who was a comedian. Um, very smart guy. And he's been accused of being fascist. Um, Nazi. Nazi. Right. But of course, he's Jewish. A Jewish Nazi. Yeah, and, 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 his, <laughs> and a good part of his family was killed during World War II, you know, 
in, in pogroms and, th and things like that. So it didn't, didn't, quite, didn't quite fit. Sir. So, Jack, we've got people with experience in virtually every branch of the armed forces in this room. Right. So since we're kind of talking about the initial stages, there's so many questions about why it failed. We've talked about a couple of them. So I'm, so breaking it down, what, what can you say about their maintenance? What can you say about the training of their troops? I'm curious about the failures of their no close air support. Their Air Force kind of disappears. I'm kind of curious what that's about. Uh, they're going to fail in the, with their Navy. Uh, and what else? Was, I mean, there's a whole bunch of things. Right. Can you kind of go through and dissect all of these things together? It, it's a very interesting thing. It is. Um, there's a number of factors that have led to the failures. Part of it is these are not people who believe in their cause. These are people who are sent in. Um, they're not well trained. They're not very good at maintenance. What I understand about the training of Russian soldiers, it's pretty brutal. Right. And it's not to make them technically adept, because I think they may at some level be afraid to have an armed forces that's too capable, hmm. which is obviously self-defeating. Yeah, I haven't heard that, but that's an interesting theory. And I've also heard that at the top level, despite needing to win the war, that the intelligence side of the Russian government and the military side are competing and don't mind when the others fall on their face. But when you get into the training of these men, it might lead to their failures of maintenance, not just a matter of not putting the money in, but actually not having proficient people and policies to make sure that this equipment, I got the sense that some of these tanks hadn't been moved. They haven't turned over the engines. Yeah. I'm just... No, I think that's accurate. Go deep down and kind of understand. I think that's accurate. That their training system is not very efficient. They're, they tend to throw force, a lot of people, as opposed to having highly trained, highly skilled people to do the job. They, you know, it's kind of like, well, that's how they fought the Germans just with people, as opposed to with, with knowledge and, and smarts in terms of tactics. And weren't they susceptible to decapitation, which I don't think we are as much? Right, yeah, but we, we tend to have power distributed through the NCO Corps, for example, is that if, if an officer is out, somebody's gonna step up and take his place. They are top heavy, and if they, if they lose a leader, it's a little more difficult for the next guy in line to step up. They have to be appointed and sent there. So it's a, it's a, it's a bad system, in, you know, logically. I'll, I'll add one thing to this. There's a complete distrust from one person to the next there. Um, so they had an equivalent of a C5 that, that we got to tour, and there's like a, a person monitoring everyone else. Oh, yeah. There's always having someone monitoring. So no, no one, is the party no one there. trusts right. anybody. Right. And I don't know how you can have leadership if you don't trust right. anybody. Sir. Which, which brings up uh, the uh, targeting of uh, high-ranking generals and such. In fact, I've heard that there's even bounties on uh, high-ranking officers amongst the Ukrainian military. So they actually will, they're targeting, obviously, the leadership. Right, well, it makes sense. Um, and I heard that part of the reason for that is their uh, cryptography and all of their radio equipment has been failing. And so they s went back to the Ukrainian cell phone wow. system. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Yeah. It's a good system. <laughs> I got one of those phones. <laughs> that's, that's, that's funny. Um, so I, I listed some reasons for why the Russians attacked in the first place. Why is it that they decided to go into to, to Ukraine? Um, obviously, Putin has got high goals. He wants to we incorporate or reintroduce either the uh, Soviet system or the Tsarist system. He, he, he kind of sees himself as a modern day Tsar of Russia. Um, and so anybody who's opposing him is put in, in off to the side. And they're gonna, successions are gonna be a very interesting thing there. Right now the number two guy is, is one of the Intel guys. Um, GRU or KGB, I'm not quite sure which one right now. But, so you got the
Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, we'll start over. <laughs> My name is Jack Sajovic, and, and I'll be speaking for the next three minutes. Um, anyway, Putin's um, succession is a very big question. And, w and the succession in Russia, what happens with R Russia after, after he's gone? But we're a long way away from that right now. He's, he has no, he's got so much money, he's got so many bodyguards, he's going to be very difficult to get at if you're trying to take him out. Sir? Well, no, his money is not, he doesn't physically have the money, but he's got all these oligarchs that right. he can tap on the shoulder and say, yeah, I'd like a hundred million dollars tomorrow morning. Right. That's or your property over here. You know, he's got these places in, in Crimea that, that are just gorgeous. Where the, where the Tsar or where the uh, head of the Soviet Union used to live. The, yes, the video well, yeah, his personal wealth is zero, but right. he's got, he's, he's made all his oligarchs yeah. who are worth billions. Right. And, uh, and, and he can tap them anytime. Yeah, they owe him. But the second he's out of power, yeah, I think it's a whole different, will be a whole different story. Yeah, hopefully it happens in our lifetimes. <laughs> How old is Putin? Do you know? I think he's my age. Maybe <laughs> 40? Very young. A little bit, little, I, think he's, I think he's 69. And I'm a little older than that. <laughs> Sir? <laughs> Health wise? We've heard rumors, but it's hard to get. He's so tough to get close to. It's hard to get real. Even for U.S. intelligence, it's hard to get confirmed information. But we've heard this about he may have cancer. Um, but it's just unsure right now what his status is. So all he wants to do is he wants to make his mark in history yeah. before he dies. Yeah. Well, I, I, let's, let's call it he's made his mark. Yeah. Let's agree on that. Get out. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, Here's a big question. Sir. What's the right way to spell Odessa? <laughs> I've seen it with one S and I've seen it with two S's. Then tell me about Kiev. <laughs> you know, when I was when I was there, when I was serving on in OSCE at the in the Donetsk area, all the towns are getting their names changed. So, my, you, so once you learn one spell, I'm going to change the name anyway. I think they did for for well, counterintelligence. Isn't the Russian alphabet different? I took Russian. Well, the Russian alphabet is weird. It's weird. <laughs> this is not Russian. Uh, that's, a, that's a Polish spelling, I think, of Kiev. But they don't use the same alphabet. They use Cyrillic alphabet, which is pretty much the same. But the, you know, there's so many similarities, but it's not the same. Um, I'm talking 60 some years ago, so. Yeah, I was there. <laughs> um, but I studied Russian. I did. For yeah, during Kennedy's administration. Um, Atlichna. Interesting, when I got sent over to the embassy the first time, we had learned Russian. I had learned Russian, so did my NCO. And with the Ministry of Defense, you could speak Russian. That's how they trained the Ministry of Defense. Ministry of Foreign Affairs, their State Department, they spoke Ukrainian, and they stuck with it. They, because they want their Ukrainian nationalists. But the military, we're very much more in favor of Russia, which made this whole dynamic very interesting with the current events that are going on there. Um, anyway, so what do I want to point out here? Um, Ukraine's a very interesting country. Poltava is, is the scene of a, one of the major battles between Peter the Great and um, Charles II, I think, from Sweden. The battlefield there is amazing. So when Sweden attacked, that's where the big defense was. Um, where are the main agricultural areas? Um, the center of Ukraine is the breadbasket of Europe, as they say. And that's another big thing that's going on right now, is Russia is trying to block the port of Odessa, where most of this would be exported, and that is going to affect the rest of the world economy. That's a great deal of agricultural resource coming out of Ukraine. Um, for a short period of time, Russia agreed to allow passage of the, of the agriculture through there, and then they threatened them immediately thereafter. 
Does Ukraine have significant gas and oil deposits or coal? And it, no, they have, the coal region is out here in, in, in this area. Gas and oil, not, not so much so. Uh, they had pipelines going through Ukraine, which they were able to take their gas and oil out of. But they, they, there's not oil and gas reserves in the center of the country. It's primarily an agricultural country. I've got a, a side question about that. My wife from Colorado, uh, northeast corner, there's a lot of they call German Russians. Uh -huh. In fact, on her mother's side, her aunts and uncles came from, from Germany. Are there still Germans in Ukraine? Um, not so, you know, you know, I hear the most of the, the Germans are was the Volga Germans, and that, that's further over in Russia on the Volga River, and there are great settlements there. Uh, no, her family did come from Ukraine. Okay, yeah. I'm not familiar with many large settlements of Germans in Ukraine, which doesn't mean they don't exist. It could be past history. Yeah. yeah. The turn of my, the century. The, Sir? My uh, grandfather was born in, in Ukraine, just on the, uh, on the north side of the Sea of Azov. Uh -huh. Probably, I, he had a di they had different names then, but they, they called it South Russia, but he was, the, they came from Germany. Well, Catherine the Great was, uh -huh. and she invited, they were to help to improve the agriculture in, in Ukraine. They invited a lot of Germans. That's probably what you're talking about. Yeah. Exactly, that's yeah. how they got there. Now, see, I'm not familiar with that. That's interesting. Yeah, that's really yeah. yeah my, he was born there in 1870. Uh -huh. And he came, they came to, he was eight years old when he came to the United States. Well, he has some stories to tell. So Sir. We, we hear a lot about the uh, oil pipelines that supposedly <coughs> runs through Ukraine. Right. Where in Ukraine does that oil pipeline run? Um, the one that they're trying to get rid of because they want to replace it with Nord Stream, right. which would bypass Ukraine. <laughs> okay. that, I mean, that's one of the big controversies right now. Why do we allow them? To why are we allowing Russia to have a pipeline, pipeline that bypasses Ukraine so they, Ukraine doesn't, doesn't have access to it, then it goes to Germany. And we've tried to put some pressure on Germany not to allow that, to, not to turn the spigot on. And I'm not even sure today what the status of that is, if they've allowed it to start up or not. But I don't think cancel is the right word, yeah. but I think they delayed it and they're using that as a bargaining chip. So. But the old pipeline through Ukraine, is that still active? Or? I don't know that it is or not. Um, that's a good question. I mean, oil and gas used to come out of central uh, Azerbaijan and that area. I'm sure you've seen the James Bond movie that takes place in there. And, um, but and it will be piped up through, through, through northern Ukraine. I should, I should have a, an indication of exactly where that went. Um, but as far as energy is concerned, a uh, big source of energy there is nuclear. And they have two power plants, one at Chernobyl, which everybody has heard of, and was threatened during this invasion from the north. They went right by it, uh, and there were some shots fired there. And the other one, which is more in the news these days, is down in Zaporozhye. And that's, that's, uh, that nuclear power plant is the largest in Europe right now. Uh, and, and it provides 20% of Ukraine's energy. So it's pretty significant. And right now there are, there are battles going on near there. And so the, the uh, nuclear regulatory agency have sent people there to try to monitor that, to make sure that we don't have another Chernobyl disaster. So that's, a, that's something to keep your eye on, is what happens at Zaporozhye. Um, okay. How did you meet your wife? Just as Honestly, I met her at church. <laughs> 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 Honest Indian. Uh, we, we met at a Catholic church in, in Kiev. Um, we had coffee like this, coffee and conversation. <laughs> and she went for, worked for Ernst & Young. She was a CPA. Um, came to the States. She worked in Boston and Minnesota. She went back over there and got a job working in the government on reforms. So, and then, of course, the reforms went through the, down the tubes. So she's now a, uh, she opened a spa over there, which we have moved to Odessa, and we're probably gonna move here. And, you know, so she does nails and hair and, and other kinds of things. If you're interested, I'll, I'll, okay. I'll get it. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I'll get her card. I, I better get her out of there first, though. That's the issue. She's stuck right now in, in Georgia with, with her two kids. So, um, so I want to talk about some of the weapon systems. We've talked a little bit about the weapon systems that are being employed. Uh, America has provided <coughs> some. I can't remember what I said. It was sixty. Sixty billion dollars in aid. Um, <coughs> well, what they need, and, and what, one of my I wrote to my friends is, what is it that Ukraine needs to win this war? Um, they need Putin to re resign first of all, but <laughs> militarily, we need artillery that can outgun their artillery, and the HIMARS system is a system that can do that. It can fire fifty miles. Um, with great accuracy. They only have, we've sent over 12 of those systems. They're excellent, excellent systems. They target and, and they take on their target and, and, and blow them up. Um, so they need a lot more of those, according to my friend. Now, 16, 16 uh, high mile system up to this point. They've attacked more than 350 Russian command posts up to this point. Um, ammo dumps, supply depots, and other high-value targets. So that, that's the kind of thing to discourage Russia. We're going to take out the, the primary logistics bases and, and weapon systems. Can we send over some of our fighter planes? Well, that's been a problem. And that's what they meant. You know, my, my, I wrote my friend over there today. He said, what is it that, that Ukraine wants? He said, send us planes. Send us fighters. The U.S. is not going to do that. The U.S. does not want to go to the next step in terms of escalation in this war. And we've been very, very, I don't want to say cowardice, but we've been very cautious about escalation. Sending HIMARS is a big deal, but sending aircraft um, is kind of a step too far as far as this administration, maybe as far as America is concerned. Does Ukraine have skilled pilots for those pilots? For those particular planes, probably not. We're, we're trying to send in MiGs right now. Polish MiGs, because that's something that's new with flying. Uh, and, that, and that's something that the process is taking some time. So the Ukrainians have fighter planes that would fly the MiGs? Well, they have pilots, absolutely. When Bob was over there, um, he came over and visited me, went to the Aviation Museum, and you saw the planes they had, and, and those were pilots that were, you were dealing with. And you flew in one of the simulators, I can't remember which, which plane that was. SU-25. SU-25 fighter. So they have skilled pilots, and if they don't bother, we're going to fly with them. Where are they targeting information if they're firing 50 miles? Pardon me? Where are they getting, or how are they getting their target information if they're shooting 50 miles? The, the U.S. is providing some intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> I can't go further than that. <laughs> Sir? What's the percentage or information on boots on the ground Support and sympathetic mercenaries, you know. Well, no Americans, no NATO oriented people have boots on the ground there, as far as we know. Uh, none that are acknowledged. Um, as far as sympathizers or mercenaries, there are, there are bodies that go over there. There are groups of people that go over there, but not in significant numbers. There are people who just feel motivated to do it, and they go over there and they, and they, and they fight. But there's not, there's not a, a battle changing number that, that has gone over there up to this point. The U.S. is training some. Where are they training them? I think they're training them in Poland. Uh, as far as I know, I, I don't know where else. Sir? Could you share with us the Cyrillic message on your the shirt you're wearing? See no. Ship. No. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is the, uh, the Battle of Snake Island. This is when the two Russian ships came and attacked, and they told the people at Snake Island they had to, had to give up. And these people said, and that's what this says. <laughs> okay. so that's why I asked if anybody read, this is actually Ukrainian, but that's why I said he spoke before I. <laughs> right, they took it out. One of, their, one of their primary ships they took out. 
could you comment more? This has turned into a kind of an evolution of drone warfare. That's a, that's a very, very important well, aspect of this. Impressive. Simple right, since we're not having to fly overhead and have planes shot down, and using pilots, we have unmanned drones that are doing the work. And one of those drones, um, I kind of remember what it's called. It's yeah. Here we go. Um, switchblade drones. They come out of the little canisters, and and it, it, it's. They don't take a lot of manpower. That's what's so nice about it. You take, you get someone trained up, and they can fire these things and zero in on a tank. And they're taking out their tanks uh, by by the score. Uh, that's a suicide drone. Yeah, well, yeah, it's, it's not coming back. <laughs> but uh, that's been a very effective weapon. And drones in general have been very effective. Um, when I was over there with OSCE back in 1617, we would see drones flying overhead and the Russians would try to shoot them down. And this is during a period of relative calm. So I mean, they're not un untouchable. So I'm sure they've got weapons that can take down drones, but if you take down a drone, you're not at least not taking a pilot down with it. So the U Ukrainians are using Turkish drones yeah, right, also. Right. And of course, the relationship between Russia and Turkey is pretty good, right? That's right. So how does, tell, can you enlighten me on how Putin is al not allowing, but what are the politics involved between Turkey and Russia on those drones being provided? Well, that's a very interesting question. But of course, Turkey has a good affiliation with NATO and with the West. So if they're asked to do something like this, they, they, it's hard for them to turn it down. Unless it, because it's not, again, it's not NATO forces going into Ukraine or, or certainly not going into Russia. These are standoff kind of situations. So they can at least rationalize it. And no one's raised up about it up to this point, as far as I know. So. Plus, Turkey controls the the straits to the Black yeah. Sea. Yeah, that's so right. Th that's right. It's a very important ally. And I always, don't always think of Turkey as an ally, but they strategically they are. Um, one of the other big thing is that U.S. and the other NATO allies are, are providing, without actually going there, 155 artillery pieces. And those have been very effective. So the drones, the, the HIMARS, and artillery are the big assets that are going in. Uh, I asked my, my buddy today, who's an ambassador, what do they need over there? He said, we need jets. I said, probably not going to happen. We need more 155s. We need more artillery, because Russia has a lot of capacity with, with artillery. But the thing is, they have to bring them down. They're not there. And Ukraine has done a good job of blowing up bridges where, where the Russian axis of advance is coming from the east. So they're not making it easy on Russia to resupply. So what has Russia been targeting? Uh, they've been going after any concentration, supply, supply depots. Of course, they went after the or they've gone after the nuclear power plant in Zaporozhye. Not directly attacking it, but attacking all around it. And that poses such a threat. Um, Chernobyl was 86, and that changed the, the face of Europe. It probably changed our desire to have nuclear, uh, nuclear power here in the States. I mean, a disaster like that has tremendous, tremendous uh, repercussions. Sir? Just an interesting point. I was in uh, Europe in the late 70s and 80s with 5th Corps. Uh, and I was with the combat battalion and then the Corps staff. And the thing that struck me is when I was in the Corps level, we had no acknowledgement or anything in our war plans to identify any nuclear power plants in Germany. Mm -hmm. And eventually I came back and wrote an article. And there were, at the time, there were 13 active nuclear power plants in Germany, from Hamburg down to down to uh, uh, Bavaria. Yet, you know, the impact of what would happen if they were targeted, mm -hmm. you know, or something went on, didn't show up in any of our war plans in terms wow. of how, what do we need to do? Mm. And so you can see, I think now they're all shut down. Germany, yeah. Germany in a way. But yeah, that adds a level of complication uh, that's tremendous. 
you know, at, a, at a time when everybody's trying to go green, n nuclear is a good alternative, except for that. Except that if there's a disaster, it, it, it impacts everybody. So I'm not going to advocate for or against, but that's, in this case, providing 20% of the power to Ukraine from that one power plant is a pretty big deal. And here, Russian forces are all around the area. So you never know when some knucklehead is going to decide to fire at it and cause major damage. And that's a, that's a real, real concern. So, Close. Yeah. Um, so how's it going to end? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it seems to me that the only hope for the Ukrainians is to just kill as many Russians as they can until the people and the, you know, it kind of comes up and we, we damage their economy to the extent. They don't seem to be impacted. With all the, with all the uh, sanctions that are being applied, it doesn't seem to affect Putin. You know, because he's isolated, he's rich, he's got everything he needs. The people have not risen up, and that's it, that's probably what would need to happen. But I, you know, that's well, probably the next level below. Putin are thank you. Well, they're probably making probably making more money now because of the price of books. So what they are selling, they're making more profit. Yeah. Well, yeah. But it's in, there's a lot of good stuff on the books. Yeah. More discussions. Yeah. Ma'am. Given that they lost 20 million people in World War II, they're not particularly cared. Yeah, they're about what happens. To they're them. able to absorb everything. I'm wondering, does the average Russian family, person, whatever, with the communication in Russia being possibly different than here, do they really know what's going on? There's a lot of propaganda. That's I don't think the information is filtering down to the people. I think well, they really don't know what they're what Putin's doing to these other people. No, I don't think they do. And when, when the soldiers are uh, captured and they're talking to the soldiers about what they know, it's very little. They're just doing what they're told. They're not thinking through this. And again, we talked about this before about uh, about decentralization, the you know, NCO type of thing. But these people aren't aware, so they're not able to act on, on independently. They're kind of, it's mass thinking. I don't want to be that overgeneralizing, but it's not That's a... That's what I figured, because I think the average Amer uh, Russian person probably would not approve of what was going on. If they knew. If they knew. And I, and I think you're probably right. But we don't really have a good insight into what they know, except that we do follow their, uh, their TV, there is Vestia and Zvezda and those sorts of things. We kind of see what's being put to them, but we don't get the reactions. It's a special operation, it's not a war. Oh, that's right, that's right. Yeah. Special military operation. Special military. Uh, family connections, though, from Ukraine and Russia. Isn't there a lot of that on there is. social media? And wouldn't there be no, social I'm just saying, like, no, it's part of my family yeah. used to live over there and is over here, so you would think there would be but can the some kind of connection. There's communication. They have cell phones, but there's, there's a limit on what they allow. And, and so that, that's, that's kind of a limiting factor. Sir? All right, what, what domino will fall that will create a bigger problem? Because you've got Poland, they've got their troops up by Belarus. You've got Turkey now threatening Greece. Turkey supplying stuff to everybody. And then you've got Iran supplying Iran. So what is that domino that's going to create the bigger problem, just like World War I and how it started? Yeah, no. <laughs> Where is this? Where is the Sarajevo effect? Um, I wish I could tell you. I, I, I wish it was predictable. I mean, the whole thing about this war—it's not predictable. Um, when he massed his forces in back in, in January, February, I was still saying there's no way he's going to go in, and I knew a lot—not enough. But I think I was like a lot of people who said there's no way he's going to do this. This is suicide, and he's killed. We're seeing 50,000 people have died there, Russians. Um, so what domino? I, you know, that, like the power plant might be the domino. Mm -hmm. If that happened, that's going to that's going to change the whole dynamic of the, of the region. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, I, I don't know what it's going to take. He's talked about extended extended warfare, maybe for years. Mm -hmm. On the Ukrainian side, they're prepared for that as well. So we're looking for dominoes. We're looking for resolution. I don't know what it's going to be. Sir? Uh, I read that this is going to go on a long, long time. Putin is not going to give in, no matter what happens on the battlefield. The Ukrainians are not going to give up because it's their homeland. 
And America has a sweet deal. We have a method of using Ukraine as a proxy to weaken Russia, which is our big, biggest threat next to China, without the loss of American soldiers. That's important. Now, what could be sweeter than that to just keep supplying that sound Ukraine like that's willing to go to war, that's willing to continue the war? So, from what I read, this can go on a long time. Yeah, I now, agree. Maybe a big thing happens, like so, that expands it, or yeah. I mean, and, well, but I think it, does, it doesn't look good for any for this yeah. anything any time. No, the short term is not optimistic. You on this as a domino, yeah. yeah, because I think this winter is going to be a domino. That's a very good point. Uh, when the, when Russia cuts off the wall, it has already done. Uh, this winter is going to be very cold for the EU, so they're going to have to make a decision. That's a good point. That's a possibility. Well, we're going to have to make a decision rather than going to up ours. Yeah. Um, we're certainly sending a lot of money into this uh, event. We've got to send fuel to Europe. I agree. We're retired A-10s that would go very well. <laughs> <laughs> how many troops are sending a lot of money? Ukraine, how many troops do they think? Are you trying to... How I many lives have been lost in all the Ukrainian thing? Um, I've, I've seen a, a bunch of different numbers. I, I, I honestly, I'm, I'm hesitant to, to cite it because I don't have a good number. Possibly, but I don't have a good number. I don't want to give you that information. So, um, so what's the hold up of getting your family here? A visa for my wife. And the State Department? Is still there. Slowly moving. Yeah, I, mean, I applied for Island 30 uh, more than two years ago before this all started. She lived in America. She worked in America. Um, maybe she was a spy. I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. Um, some people have recommended that I just can't see going through the lines in Mexico. So we're in we're in Georgia right now very comfortable living. Um, she's able to make some money with her business. So we don't want to leave something good until we know we've got a, a route. Um, I've already checked out schools here for the kids, so I'm prepared. What grade are they? They're both five, five-year-old twins. Oh, wow. On a personal <coughs> side, what language do you and your wife communicate? With? We normally speak English. Um, we speak some Russian. She trusts my Russian enough. She speaks Ukrainian with everybody else, so, but Russian seems to be a common denominator. How close is Russian and Ukrainian? I've heard two How comparable? How close, yeah, how close in language? They're, they're cousins. They're, I mean, there's a, the, you would probably recognize 60% of the words, but there's enough of it that's not the same that makes communication a challenge. So. It's like Alabama, in New England. <laughs> 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 right, there, there's another good example. So, um, There are some issues with Russian supply shortages. You may, may have been reading about that lately. They're now buying supplies from North, from North Korea, buying artillery from North Korea and from Iran. They're buying drones from Iran. And these are not first-class systems that they're buying. So th to think that Russia is uh, winding down their supplies is a positive. But they have such enormous reserves of everything that it's not like we can, I don't think we're going to a war of attrition with them, either people or supplies. We can certainly uh, diminish what they have and make it more difficult for them, but that's a, that's a tough war to win. So. To what degree are Uzbek, or not Uzbekistan, Ukrainian special forces going over into Russia? I've not heard of that, and maybe it's happening, but if, they, if it's happening, they're doing a good job of keeping it quiet. Um, they're, they're sending missiles into some of the uh, ammo depots, and so they're targeting some of the places in, in Russia, but they're not, and they haven't wanted to do that. They don't want to widen the war. That would give Russia an excuse to do whatever they want to do, as if they need one because they're, they're doing whatever they want to do anyway, but then they would have some, some degree of, of 
of uh, viability for their, for their actions. And now this whole thing has been, their attack was based on what? Um, they're worried that Ukraine is getting too close to NATO and they are threatening Russia. Uh, the first may be partially true, as you saw the expansion in, 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 in uh, Sweden and in, uh, Finland. But as far as attacking, there's not been any effort to attack Russia. So they're perceived threat. Perceived threat, but they're, they're, Putin's paranoid, the Russians are paranoid, and a perceived threat is enough for them to take these drastic actions, sir? Well, it's uh, a book called The Road to Unfreedom by a guy named Snyder, who's fluent in Russian, German, and English. Yeah. He's in Vienna, and he says, the bottom line of the book is that the problem that Putin has with everything to his, pretty much everything to his west is that we exist. Yeah. It's not a matter of military threat. It's our very existence. Yeah. Because as long as we live, Russians look and they see a life that is much superior. Yeah. And that is a problem because he's an autocrat and he needs people to believe that they need him as a leader and that Russia has something to offer. Well, they had inevitability until communism failed. And then he tried eternity, which is reaching out to the, be the Vladimir, the savior of the Greek and Russian Orthodox religions when the Greeks turned him down. So what he's got left is, we are a threat, whether we act militarily or otherwise. And that's why he's always gonna fret about a country like Ukraine deciding to have an orange revolution. Who's gonna be next? He looks at the domino thing from a different perspective. That's Who goes from blue jeans and the Beatles are going to show up again? <laughs> <laughs> sure. How effective do you think are uh, actions to limit Russian activity are? You know, the bank activities, uh, mm. the uh, sanctions that we put, put on their oil. Uh, how, are those effective or are we just kind of whistling in the wind? I don't see them as being effective enough. Um, they're, they're always outs for him. You know, yeah, what was the banking system that we stopped? It was the, uh, he, finds, he finds alternative ways around it. It hurts, people over there are hurt by this. Even, even all the oligarchs are hurt by this. They don't have access to all of their money, but they have access to enough of their money. So I'm not sure that sanctions are gonna be sufficient to dissuade him from continuing his attack, which doesn't mean we shouldn't continue sanctions. We should, we gotta put as much pressure on him as, as possible. Um, so. Recently there is a uh, banker that uh, is under sanctions that is going to make some kind of a several billion dollar donation to the Ukraine. Really? Did you see this? No, I didn't as, see it. As long as he is taken off the sanctions list. Uh, <laughs> I just saw it a couple days ago. I can't remember the details. But That's curious. So I'm hoping that that doesn't happen because that would just encourage more people to... Yeah. But his system has got to be crumbling to some degree. I mean, he's got enough there to continue his war, but at the margins, he's, things are being eaten away from him. And who knows when a big enough bite will be taken that, that he'll say, this is, uh, or he won't be the one who will quit, but somebody close to him will say, let's get this guy out of here. Well, hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. That's, that's just a, we're gonna pray. Yeah. <laughs> well, but someone knows where he sleeps. You can I ask one other question? Now, what's the health care system like in Ukraine with all this? When, when things happen, where do people go? Well, there's still hospitals and clinics are open everywhere. And I've been to several of them. They're not to the U.S. standard, but you can get health care. Okay. And it's not expensive. And you get what you pay for. Yeah. <laughs> but you, get, but you, get, you can get treatment. It's, yeah, you can get treatment. It's not decimated. No. No. Okay. Well, what, maybe one more question. It's a comment. I think that's a great question. When the uh, wall fell in Berlin, in the next decade, the life expectancy, the r average Russian dropped by a decade. <coughs> so mm -hmm. they haven't changed much in terms of their medical care. Mm -hmm. 
So Ukraine's morale and their ability to get soldiers back into the front, this is a very hidden, kind of helpful mm -hmm. support from the West. Yeah. And morale's a really good point. The morale on the Ukrainian side is sky high. I, get, I have contact with a lot of people who are in the military or other services over there, and they're just fired up. There's, there's a counteroffensive that began uh, yesterday, and it's been very successful. So uh, Ukraine is not giving up. They're pushing, and they're, and they're not going to give up. They're fighting for their homeland. I'm just surprised the Russians haven't taken out Zelensky. They, they said right after that. Right, right, right after that, they threatened to do that. And, and he's been, he's shown such courage. He hasn't left. He's sitting in the palace. He said, come and get me. So. Well, Jack, well, thank you so much. It was a fascinating talk. And I'd like to give you one of our challenges. Thank you. Thanks, it's a pleasure. Thank you for your questions and your attention.